Welcome to the Speak the Truth show. We're here. I'm here, CJ, representing Black Men in America, political commentator, here to just step in for my dad, who is out traveling right now. So I'm going to just curate this thing and kick it over to the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Harold Bell. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to Speak the Truth, as Chris says. About four or five weeks ago, uh, we had, um, we did a segment on the Black Farmers. And it was a great segment. And uh, we invited them back because we needed, we thought we needed to follow up. Uh, so as you know, as of today, the big news around the world, of course, is Donald Trump. Uh, the coronavirus, uh, we uh, got 7 million people infected. We got 200,000 plus, like 10, that are dead in America. And as, as, as all of you know, uh, Donald Trump was the one that was calling the thing a, a fake, a hoax, and everything else. And uh, just a couple of days ago, after the debate with Joe Biden, he came down with the coronavirus. Now he's up at uh, Walter Reed Hospital uh, trying to recover. So I think that's one way that we need to start off the show because I'm kind of confused when I hear Joe Biden say, well, we're going to stop all ads because Donald Trump is in the hospital. All of a sudden, why do you want to play fair now? Ain't nobody playing fair. So why do you want to stop your ads? If you were in the hospital with the coronavirus, do you think that Donald Trump would call off his ass? So we, we got all kinds of mis, mixed messages going here. And we got about 30 days left before the election. So I would just want to like open that up to everyone. And then we'll come with the, the black farmers and 40 acres and a mule or whatever. But just take a look at, at what's happening because we are fighting for our lives right now. Make no mistake about it, man that this election is very important to us and we need to get everyone out and make sure they know how important it is that they go to the polls. So I want to bring in uh, uh, my, my, my dear friend. Uh, she's been off for a couple of weeks, uh, took, took a break, but she is a, you know, a, a former uh, writer for the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, uh, the New York Times. He's at the, in the School of Communications at Morgan State, and uh, I'm talking about the one and only who's been for decades, uh, Ms. Jackie Jones. How you doing, Jackie? I'm good, Harold. How are you today? Okay. Good. I got to tell you, um, I have such mixed feelings about how to, how to go at this thing. Um, like you, I, I thought Biden doesn't gain anything by, uh, by playing nice, but the other thing I've noticed is how distracted people have been just by the whole discussion of, of um, Trump's illness. And I think that this is a good opportunity to just figure out what his record has been and to just day by day by day look at everything from the treatment of black farmers, his stance on uh, the coronavirus, especially since it has a disproportionate impact on the black community, uh, looking at his stance on taxes, looking at his stance on all kinds of things that are gonna impact us down the road. So you don't have to attack him, all you gotta do is tell the truth. So some friends were uh, uh, debating on Facebook whether uh, Trump's uh, announcement was even true or fake. And I said, doesn't matter. I said, every day we're gonna put something online that's, that you have researched, reported yourself, or that you can cite reliable sources to explain what Trump's policy has been on any number of issues. And I said, now I'll go first. So yesterday I looked at the uh, payroll tax deduction and the impact that it would ultimately have on social security. Uh, today I looked at um, um, what Trump said about the, the um, Affordable Care Act and, and his saying that, uh, you know, in back in, in August, he wrote this executive order that, um, uh, would keep insurers from uh, denying insurance based on, on pre-existing conditions. And so I said, but the, the Affordable Care Act already does that. And what he didn't say is there is no precedent that shows that an executive order would change any of that if they managed to completely overthrow the Affordable Care Act. And people have gotten used to those certain provisions that 
put limits on insurers, but they, and they think Trump has done that. But the fact is it's been in effect for 10 years and it came in under the Obama administration. So when all is said and done, the things that you enjoy and you think that Trump is gonna protect are a result of Obamacare, not a Donald Trump. And I think that this is the time to just hammer that stuff home day in and day out. Because if you get it caught up in the debate of, of, of whether Trump's telling the truth or lying, we already know it's the latter. So why don't we just focus on the impact of his policies and what they've done to black people and just remind them day in and day out, this is where your focus ought to be and this is what ought to be front of mind when you go to vote. Fantastic. Chris, follow up with that, Chris. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I have a kind of a counterintuitive opinion about Biden and him not running negative ads because as uh, Ms. Jones said, you don't have to run negative ads. Biden didn't stop campaigning. I think him running negative ads against Trump will backfire anyway. We already know Trump is bad. And I think that strategy and making it a referendum on Trump is a mistake. So I think he does have something to gain by actually not going negative. It does show a distinction and just human decency in the candidates. Biden's strength is not policy. He should focus on the policies where he's better than Trump, which is mostly everything, even though he's not great and he's not you, he's, he's not offering enough to excite a lot of people on policy. So he needs to lean in to where he it does have a clear advantage over Trump, which is just human decency and overall competence. And he should lean into that as well. So I, I think it is a, a good strategy to, to actually go high on this one as much as I have struggled to find sympathy for Trump and him having COVID or whether it's a distraction or not. I honestly, I also agree that I don't care whether it's true or not. It, it, we need to stay focused on the election coming up and policy and not you know, Donald Trump wouldn't be wishing anyone well if they got COVID-19. Let's keep it real. He'd probably be running attack ads against Biden. <laughs> Let me add something to that real quick. Um, when Sydney, the late Sidney Shanberg, who was um, a, a reporter for the New York Times for many years and, and then later a columnist at, at, at Newsday, um, he had a heart bypass surgery in the 80s. And Donald Trump sent him a card wishing him a long and painful recovery. What? Yep, I talked to his widow, uh, Shanberg's widow, yesterday, and she wow. said she reminded me that Sidney had gotten this card from Trump back in the '80s when you know Sidney was calling him out in his column for not being the billionaire that he claimed to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and Michael Stovall, yeah. yeah, Michael Stovall, welcome back. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing great, sir. How you doing? Thank All you. All right. Uh, all right, you want to follow up on something about Trump and this coronavirus in the upcoming election? Well, to me, with the upcoming election, uh, Trump hadn't had put any policies out there for black people at all. And right now, he's trying to throw a few things on the table to make pretend that he is for black community, knowing all the time he's not. You know, we're dealing with Biden, like the young man say, you got two of the evils. So you need to pick one or the other because uh, Biden not trying to do anything to fix the problem at the USDA when it comes down to black farmers and losing over 15 million acres of land. That's a lot of land to be lost in the black community. Mm -hmm. We steady losing wealth across this country because of discrimination from the federal government. You look at, you got one evil, one worse than the other. So you pick your choice. That's, that's the only thing I could say because Biden got little policies out there and, you know, he, his track record is not very good as well, even though Trump's even worse. So you, you just, you just have to divide who you feel like is more that you've leaning toward. So, but I wouldn't vote for Trump. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. So thank you very much. Okay. Lawrence Lucas, our leader. What's happening, Lawrence? How are you doing? Thank you for having me. But just on this issue of, uh, uh, Trump, I, I, I think that uh, the American people will make a decision as to what they feel about uh, Trump and the next and the upcoming uh, campaign. Uh, I think the most important thing that we have is the vote. And I kind of agree with what Michael said that uh, we have two people running. You don't have three or four. You don't have independents uh, and others. 
so you have a you have a choice and and what you have to do is based on where you sit and where you think uh, these two individuals uh, and what they can do for you and the people and the people that you either serve or uh, the American people, I think that they, each one of us have to make a decision. Um, I believe that, um, I believe in divine intervention and I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, do, do you have that video that we can run for a couple of minutes as we bring in the black farmers? Can you run Absolutely. that video for us, Chris? Yep, just give me one. Okay. <clears throat> we'll go take a look at this video and uh, then we go come in on this segment with the black farmers and see what that status is and exactly where we are. And um, uh, Chris will put that up in a second. <clears throat> Jackie, did you go out of town? Oh, okay, there you go. Had no sound with it, Chris. What's happening? Okay, Chris, you can uh, cut that back and, and uh, Brother Lawrence will be able to bring us up to date on exactly what's happening here. And who is John Bull? Okay, Chris, you can cut it back. Okay, Lawrence, tell us uh, what we were getting ready to look at there. Uh, who is John Boyd and what is he to uh, the Black Farmers? Uh, John Boyd is uh, one of many uh, black leaders in the black community and the rural community uh, that uh, has, in fact, has contributed uh, in the early days. Uh, he was the one who got me involved, meeting me down at uh, St. Augustine and uh, down south. And um, I was spending most of my time on employee issues in 1994. But uh, he was the one who came to me and sat down and um, one night, and we talked about the issues of black farmers because my focus were primarily uh, because the USDA Coalition of Minority Employees was focusing primarily on employee issues. Uh, I had heard about black farmers, and he brought this to my attention, and he has been one of many leaders that have uh, stepped up uh, years ago, along with many other farmers, because uh, I think the National Black Farmers Association was founded not by John Boyd, but I think it may have been originally founded by a group of black farmers out of Texas and Alabama. And um, he has been a piece of the puzzle of bringing attention to the issue of black farmers and what the U.S. Department of Agriculture has done in destroying the lives of black farmers and destroying uh, 
the ability for them to farm. At the same time, what people don't understand, and Michael Stovall and uh, 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 Wayman will give you some history uh, in this regard, but the USDA Department of Agriculture has been the impediment and the, the instrument by which land loss, millions of acres have been taken back from black farmers. This, we talking about three, 400 years. And after slavery, all this land that was, that was able to be acquired after slavery, uh, historically and historically has been taken back because we have a process of racism and, uh, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture that have denied black farmers their land, taken their land. They've also uh, taken a way of life from them, uh, their ability to uh, educate, and they did a fine job of doing that. With, with the, and we have doctors and lawyers and, and professionals around this country because of it. But uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is the instrument by which they have systematically deprived black farmers of their land. But most important also is the fact that they have taken the wealth, the wealth that would ordinarily be passed on from generation to generation the growth and the ability of their farms to grow and become more economically stable, even in a unstable environment like we have today. But I think that uh, Wayman and I think that Stovall and, and the, Ms. Hishaw, we're going to talk about uh, the farmers. We're going to talk about a documentary. Uh, we're going to talk about a book. Um, uh, uh, Mrs. Highshaw is on also. And what we're going to talk about is those things that brought us to this period in time and history where we have seen the taking of, of land from black farmers. And the problem is that if we would have all worked together and all our leaders would have done what they were supposed to do. We wouldn't have this deprivation and this continual effort by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to deny uh, black farmers a way of life. They also discriminate against employees, rape, sex, monkey dolls, people call the N-word, uh, hangman's nooses, hangman's games. Um, I remember the first exposure I really had was when, uh, during the Clinton administration, when I went into a bathroom in the Department of Agriculture in Washington, and on the bathroom door, it says uh, NAACP, now apes are called people. That was part of a baptism, uh, but of course, my, my baptism as it relates to civil rights started in 19, deeply in 19, uh, 1964 on the mall and heard the words of Dr. King and I've been following that ever since. That being said, I think we have uh, Michael Stovall, we have uh, Wayman Henson, we have, um, we also have Ms. Highshaw. Now, I wanna start with, um, I think it would be good to start with a farmer because a farmer can explain to you better than I can and better than Wayman can, as well as Ms. Highshaw, about the deprivation and what he suffered and many other farmers have suffered. Uh, Michael Stovall, a farmer from Alabama, head of the Independent Black Farmers, have been in this struggle for 20 some odd years, seen people uh, march, seeing people demonstrate, and seeing many of his colleagues and some of our friends die waiting for justice at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have, uh, we'll probably have Wayman Henson and have Ms. Hishaw after that, and then Wayman. Um, Michael, can you tell us 
based on uh, where we are now. Have anything changed since we were on air a number of weeks ago? Uh, if so, but even the new listening public, tell them about your experience and what we are trying to do to change this uh, plantation culture at USDA. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Stovall. I'm from Town Creek, Alabama. I'm a black farmer. I'm a fourth generation of farmers. My experience uh, with the finding of discrimination and breach of settlement agreement, ongoing discrimination cases. Uh, I started out in 1993, applied for a loan and was denied and appealed and won my appeal process. Uh, during that period of time, uh, I tried to purchase a farm in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, bought 66 cows and a tractor and a hay bale and a hay cutter. I was given an eight and a half percent interest loan versed on qualified for the four and a half percent interest loan and was denied an appeal. Once I won the appeal process, I was getting ready to take cows to the farm and they locked me out of the farm. One of the USDA employees bought the farm up and under me. Mm. Um, on, on top of that, um, I had 59 cows in the stockyard with nowhere to go. So I ended up leasing a farm in Limestone County, kept that farm for over a year, tried to purchase that farm. And then the USDA stepped in because I was getting on television telling how racist this company is, how USDA have destroyed many black farmers' lives, including mine. They came in at the end of the day, they killed my cows and rustled my cows and at night, mm -hmm. brought me up on erroneous animal charges went to court and they gave me two years probation, even after sitting in the courtroom and the U.S. attorney said that these cows ain't stopped to death, ain't no way. The judge told them to be quiet, don't say that. We finna, you know, do whatever they had to do to me to hush me up. So all those things I experienced, put in jail, locked up. Then I won those cases. They turned around and said that the USDA discriminated against me. I won that part, then they turned around and breached the settlement agreement after discriminating against me again. So I was run off the road and harassed and killed cows and destroyed my chicken house. I got chicken houses now set and empty. They held up the lawns to keep me from getting in operation. I was supposed to get priority consideration, farm ownership and operating loan. I didn't get no real money from the settlement. They supposed to get me back in business and they breached that. So. I'm just kind of giving you a little outlet because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to make it so long and bumpy, but I'm just trying to give you a little layout. But that's what they do to black farmers across this country. They destroy their lives so they can take that, so they can take the land. It's all about the land. It's all about building wealth. If they can keep you beneath them, that's what they do. And it's all, it's all a good old boy thing to keep the black farmers from being able to build wealth. You can, the quickest way to build wealth is land ownership because land increases. They don't make no more land. It's a farm sold down the street from me. It was 580 acres. That land bought $3.5 million in the last two years. So that's how quickly land values increases in, the, in certain farming areas. So they want to make sure that you don't own the well. And it went from one administration to the other. Not only the Republicans, the Democrats, just as bad as the Republicans. It's the same old, same old. Get along. So... My thing is, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. It's about doing what's right. Because at 400 years of slavery, we, we inquired millions of acres of land. We lost over 15 million acres of land because of discrimination of the, of the federal government. They're the main leaders. A lot of farmers left the South going north because they couldn't farm. They look, went looking for other jobs because they had to leave the farm because they didn't have no they didn't have no resource to, to keep farming because they were being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And this agency have destroyed many, many black families' lives. And you talking about the biggest subsidy. Do you, can you imagine how much government subsidies these farmers get a year? This farmer over there close to my mom, they got over $9 million in the last six and a half years. That's a lot of money that be given to farmers. That's where the biggest welfare fraud is, the agriculture industry, because the government controls the market. When the prices are high, you make good crops. When the prices are low, the government steps in, pays you subsidies because of the market is so low. So, you know, that's how they run us out. 
They hold up the loans to keep us from getting an operation. You apply for a loan, your loan, your crop is due to be in the ground in March. You apply it in November. You might not get no money until June. It's too late mm-hmm. to plant the crop. And you might not get the amount of money that you need, and it's late. So if you don't take the money, because you got your living expenses in there as well, they run you out of business. One year lead to the next year, you have a bump crop. And that crop going to hurt you from, from now on especially when the market is low. So this run you completely out of business. People like John Boyd, we all started out together. A lot of those people get so high on the totem pole, they get tied in with the government. And when they get mm-hmm. tied in with the government, as long as they can get what they want, they ain't concerned mm-hmm. about you. They ain't concerned about the next farmer. I was 29 years old. I'll be 57 this month. I've seen a lot of farmers die because mm-hmm. of discrimination. So... Uh, it's just unbelievable what they do and continue to do to black farmers across this country. Wow. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you very you much. Uh, that's, that'll give you all an idea of uh, what's happening and what has happened to black farmers. Uh, many of the farmers we started with, uh, Lupe Garcia, uh, George Hildebrand, Hezekiah Gibson. Um, These farmers who started in the struggle, they're no longer alive. Um, It's it's just heartening to have to listen to Mr. Stovall and listen to what he said and this trail that not only he, but so many other farmers have followed because of the discrimination at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, let me now introduce uh, Julian Hyshaw. Uh, in 2012, Ms. Hyshaw, after graduating, she launched an organization called the Family Agriculture Resource Management Service, i.e. Farms, uh, an organization uh, to help black farmers and all farmers from historical disadvantaged groups in the Southern region of the United States. Uh, She has spent many days and hours and nights uh, visiting, doing research in this area and talking to black farmers. And we're fortunate enough to have her on today and I thank her for being here and I thank also Uh, Black Men in America for having us on. Uh, She's going to tell you about uh, this path that she's followed, but the beauty of this, she's now finishing up a book, and this book is going to deal with some of the systemic long history of discrimination that has been documented, and this book is coming out soon, so uh, Julian, Please join us, and I know that uh, you may not come on visually, but I, I see you here. Ex- explain, talk to them, uh, our listening group, about uh, this journey that you've been on and what's happening and why you're writing this book, the name of the book, and when it's coming out. Yes, yeah, so thank you, um, everyone, for having me. My name is Jillian Hyshaw, and i um, I've been working in the area of ag law and policy. I'm an attorney for um, a little over 15 years. And I started farms. I originally um, am from Kansas City. And I was working in DC um, within USDA under the Office of Civil Rights. And I left my position um, there. And then I worked a little bit on the Keeps Eagle class action which was the um, tribal nation or indigenous farmers um, class action similar to Pigford. And um, from there, I um, started farms. And so we have three programs. One of course is legal services where I purposefully focus on aging farmers, um, particularly black farmers of color. And I provide them with estate planning Um, farm foreclosure, um, and of course, civil rights um, support. And not only uh, um, in terms of USDA, but also outside of USDA. Like I have a farmer that she 
invested thousands of dollars in a hemp crop, but recently her white uh, neighbor just sprayed um, Roundup Ready on the crop uh, two weeks before harvest. And so, you know, things like this is going on. Unfortunately, we also have a food bank program where I, I basically write grants and I pay the farmers for the produce and then it's donated um, in rural communities. And then we have a farmer's fund where we purposefully give money to farmers in crisis, whether it's a late farm payment to prevent um, foreclosure, also to, um, I recently gave a $5,000 to um, about 20 different landowners in South Carolina to prevent a, a tax lien on Monday. And so these are the issues. And the reality is, is that 68% of black folk just in this country die without a will. And when you die without a will, that creates heirs property. And about 70%, uh, nearly 70% of black owned land in this country is owned that way. It's owned, you know, through heirs property, which is multiple relatives owning, you know, a hundred acre. And if one relative sells to a third party, oftentimes it's a white developer, they can force the sale of the 99 heirs. And so USDA knows all this. USDA knows that there's a lack of estate planning and USDA can take advantage of this. And so, for example, between 1910 and 1997, 90% of black owned land was lost. And going back to Mr. Stovall, that's equivalent to 15 million acres. Now, during the same amount of time, only 2% of white folk lost their land. And that's even considering the 1980s uh, farm crisis. So that's, you know, a very stark comparison. Also, the number of black farmers declined by 98% between that same time period between 1920 and 1997. Also, um, USDA is six times more likely to foreclose on black farmers compared to whites. Also, under the Bush administration between 2001 and 2008, there was only one finding of discrimination. Also, under the Clinton administration, the average time for loan applications of white farmers was 60 days compared to 220 days mm -hmm. uh, for blacks. Also, under the Obama administration from 2006 to 2016, Black farmers, they only made up less than 3% of direct farm loan recipients, but they made up 13% of farm foreclosures. And the reality also of this situation is that over 97% of land in this country are owned by white people. And this is what I put in my book. I do this work because my grandfather my own family lost our land in Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Uh, on a dishonest lawyer took advantage of my grandfather and my great grandmother. She was sending the money to the lawyer to pay the taxes. The lawyer pocketed the money and the land was sold in a tax lien sale. So when the elders in my family found out, they found out also that where my grandfather's house used to be, there's an oil rig going up and down. The land had known oil deposits. And so this is why I've committed to doing this work for 15 years, because I want to give aging farmers like my great grandmother and my grandfather an honest lawyer. And trust me, they are hard to find. Honest lawyers are hard to find when it comes to land. And I don't care if you're black or white, it's just, it's hard to find. I wrote a book starting in 2007 is called Systematic Land Theft. It'll be released um, by the end of this month. And thank goodness for Mr. Henson's editing um, capabilities. Um, I'm in the final editing stages, sending it off to the layout person and the printer um, within a week. And it should be um, in paperback available for $20, $25 for sale on my website. I also published another book 
don't bet the farm on Medicaid two years ago because the reality is, is that the average age of the U.S. farmer is 58.5 and over according to the 2007 USDA census that came out last month, last year, April of last year. And nursing homes are taking land through Medicaid liens. People don't realize that when you qualify for Medicaid, that opens up your land and your house, even if you own a house in the middle of Atlanta. Right. That, o that opens up your land and your house to a Medicaid lien. So mm -hmm. if you owe an outstanding debt to the nursing home, the nursing home could put a lien on your house and your land. And I'm in third edition of that book and I go through 17 states and I look at all of the lien law exemptions. In certain states like Florida and Georgia, in Georgia, you can exempt your home and your land up to a certain amount from these uh, Medicaid liens. But I can go on and on, but thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you. Hold on. Um, what I'd like for you to do um, before you go, uh, and I want you to stay on as long as you can. Yes, uh, I will. What's the name of your book? And oh, yeah, Systematic, Systematic Land Theft. Systematic Land Theft. That's the name of the book. And your website. Uh, Jill, my name is uh, Jillian, J-I-L-L-I-A-N, and my last name is H-I-S-H-A-W.com, JillianHighshaw.com. Okay. And then my org's website is 30,000acres.org because, again, we lose 30,000 acres per year in black land ownership in this, in this uh, country. 30,000 acres per year of year black land is lost. Um, um, okay. Uh, uh, Harold, were you getting ready to say something? I don't. I didn't want if you had a question. No, no. Okay. I, no, I just wanted to make sure that we had the, her information, the website where we can uh, find her and get that book and support her. That yes. was great. That was great information. Man. We can get that up on the site too. Okay, that's oh, great. yeah. We put it up on the website. Thank that's you. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Good. much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, um, Julian. Uh, don't go away unless you have something uh, more bearing. There may be some more questions to be asked yes, uh, and, and add to some of the dialogue that may come later. Uh, we also have with us uh, today, uh, Mr. Wayman Henson, a, a very, I found him to be a very remarkable individual. Um, I, I can't say the kind of support that uh, he's given to black farmers going all the way back to, I think, 1954. I think we were at the same conference and, and, um, and we never met during that conference, but uh, he's been involved with the black farmers. Um, he, for example, uh, he earned a degree in theology uh, and a, psychologist, a licensed psychologist, um, and he's a family therapist in uh, Texas. His history with black farmers uh, is extended through like uh, through and go takes back to 1994, and he began began to consult and work with farmers and their legal counsel as they were going through uh, Pickford One and Pickford Two during the Clinton administration. Uh, there's so much I can say about him, but he has been a very pivotal pivotal. Uh, point um, in this conversation by joining in and volunteering to work with the coalition and some of the strenuous work that we do. But uh, he and Sean Hill, they met with uh, Gary Grant, Black Farm in North Carolina, BIFA, uh, a, a very long supporter of Black Farmers. And Wayman has been involved with putting together a documentary. But not only has he been putting together a documentary, and I, I want him to talk about that, but uh, Wayman has been a pivotal role and has been aggressively fighting for black farmers, even in 2020. So his struggle and his commitment to civil rights, human rights, and especially to this issue of black farm is phenomenal. Uh, Wayman, I can't, there's not enough to say about you, but uh, please come in, uh, Mr. Henson, and share with our listening listeners 
about uh, why you did doing this book and why are you so involved with Black Farmers in 2020? Well, th <clears throat> thank you for those kind words, uh, Lawrence. I'm, I'm honored to be walking uh, in your shadow uh, in the area of policy development, in the area of uh, legislation. <clears throat> So my involvement with Black Farmers goes back to 94 when uh, a lawyer by the name of uh, James Meyer invited me on to do uh, work in terms of psychological assessment of, uh, with the first four farmers cases that were settled. There were actually 15 farmers that settled with the feds at between 1997 and 1999. So it was my privilege and honor and burden to work with four of those. So I met them on their farms or they came to see me in Abilene. I wrote these lengthy reports, sent them to an attorney who sent them to another attorney uh, and they decided how much they were going to sue the federal government for. So my fingers were not in that. My fingers were in the area of pain and suffering. So my job was to assess their lives before the USDA got involved and messed things up. And then my job was to compare and contrast that with where they were after the USDA had really screwed over these farmers. So the buzz phrase there is pre-morbid and post-morbid conditions. So I got involved because the stories of farmers was incredibly compelling. So take all that Michael shared with us and that's just a microcosm of his world. And then multiply that times thousands, thousands and thousands of other farmers, and that injustice was the thing that compelled me to get involved. And I believe for a long time that I can't do everything, but I can do something. And so whether it's volunteering to be a part of the coalition with Lawrence, or whether it can be, um, developing a documentary that tells a larger story. Uh, I just want to be a part of doing something uh, that, that's worthwhile. And so when we take Michael's story and say that there are many, many more farmers who lost their livelihood, their health, their well-being, their farms. So as Jillian mentioned, or maybe somebody mentioned, back in the early 20s, 1910, 1920, at that time, all records indicate there were something like 925,000 farmers, and those farmers owned or, or farmed something to the tune of 19 million acres. And if you run that around the now, I see two different sets of figures. I see one set of figures that says that there are 45,000 farmers, but then another set of figures that I saw the other day said, no, there's something like 5,000 farmers. And those farmers, those 35,000 farmers are farming something to the tip of a little over 5 million. And so if you think about that loss, that's really incredible. And then there's a, um, another set of people that we get to hang out with periodically. We're about to come out with another document that talks about the actual values lost in terms of uh, uh, family generational wealth. And so if you take all of the land lost by farmers from the very beginning up to now, the land loss is something somewhere between $300 billion mm. and $1 trillion. Mm. Now that will take your breath away. And so if we believe as we do, America was built up the backs of black people, whether it's uh, a White House or buildings in D.C. or the, whatever the case may be. And when you think about what America owes, the number is absolutely staggering. And when you look at the by which the USDA from black farmers, absolutely riveting. And when you look at the fact that they've stolen the land and yet they pay no price, 
for having raped and robbed and pillaged black farmers from their livelihood, their health, their identity. Farmers would say things to me like, my blood is on this land. Farming is in my DNA. And so some of the farmers that I interviewed were able to trace their family lineage back to enslaved. And so they can show people were owned by somebody. They were working and owned by somebody. And then they get their own land and then it's taken away by people who frankly look like me. In fact, there was one farmer's wife who, I'm not sure if she'll make the documentary or not, but uh, Mrs. Williams, Laverne Williams out of uh, Texas said, uh, she said, we were intended to work the land we were never intended to own the land. And that's profound. So when black people get to own too much, looking too sick, there are all sorts of machinations that land away. And, and when that land is taken away, guess who's there to buy it? Guess who's going to buy it on the courthouse? family of the USDA County Committee who knew that it was coming, or family members of the bank who knew that they were not to foreclose on the farmers. So it's like there are people, I know this sounds like a big old huge conspiracy theory, but um, Stovall and Ms. Hyshaw can confirm this. There are people out there waiting in the shadows to take their land See, mm -hmm. and time and time again and and so all of that i'm not sure how much um you want me to segue now lawrence into the documentary but yes that's, that's just the background and so to, to to be very quick uh about the documentary uh when i met the four, first four farmers uh 94 worked with them up through and then since then, those stories were so incredibly riveting that I thought they're still being told. So I had this dream for a long time for telling their stories in a larger setting, but they never had the money. Thought we had the money at work, but it went to some other place. Sean Hill and I wrote several grants, and somebody else got the money that we thought we needed. Mm. Then I was talking with Gary Grant one day. I'm actively involved with people. In North Carolina, Gary Grant, a human being, his entire family. So we had been, people had been encouraged to apply for leftover Cypress funds from Bigfoot 2. So I just simply proposed to Gary if they want you to have this money, then let's build in some dollars to fund the documentary. And so here's the irony. The federal government is funding Sean Hill, Wayman Hinson, to tell the story of what they do to farmers. Now tell me that's not strange. The federal government's dollars is funding in part Hill and Hinson to tell the stories what they did to black farmers. So between those funds from BIFA, plus uh, about that same amount of money from friends across the country, we went on a three-year journey, and we interviewed uh, people deeply involved in the Black Farm Movement, uh, people, like, people like Mike Espy, uh, people like Lawrence Lucas, people like Pete Daniel, who at that time was uh, at the Smithsonian Institute and wrote some really good books along these lines. And then there were 15 farmers who settled with the Fed between. 97 and 99 and by their commitment to telling their stories and by the grace of God and a lot of tenacity we were able to find locate and interview nine of those farmers. now they could be the farmer the farmer's wife the farmer's daughter the farmer's living sons but out of those 15 farmers we interviewed uh, nine of them. In one of those interviews, uh, Michael Stovall, 
his contribution to the film is outstanding. So what we did was to orchestrate things. I simply asked the question, Sean had on, and so the farmers really are telling their, <clears throat> they're telling their story in their own words of what it was like to be on the precipice of the middle. They tell in their own the grief and the agony and suffering with tears, clenched jaws, uh, because as they're telling their stories, even though it's in uh, 2018, 20, that they're doing so, they are reliving their stories of land loss. And so it's like we are asking them to reach down deep into their souls and tell us these stories that still linger because America needs to know. And who better can tell the story of black land loss than those people who came really close uh, to losing their land if they didn't lose their land. W one more thing and, and I'll be quiet here. Even though those nine farmers settled with the federal government and what that means, <clears throat> and, and Michael dropped some of these words in, what that means is that they got number one, compensatory damages. Number two, they got relief. And number three, they got priority. So those three things were promised in contractual agreements. But not all got the same level of compensatory damages because the Office of General Counsel came in and said, you can't give them that much money. Some farmers still have not experienced debt relief. And basically none of the farmers ever got priority. And so they threw the farmers on the front end and they mess them over to the back end. And you know, that's a double, double, double wrong. So the film, the documentary will uh, tell those stories. When, uh, uh, wait a minute, when will, when, when will the documentary, uh, the title of the documentary, and when will it be coming out, and how, um, how can we and our listeners uh, get a copy of it? The, uh, the film is called, um, I'm just a layman in pursuit of justice. The, the, the subtitle is Black Farmers Fight the USDA. Um, if you haven't gotten it yet, we'll need to make sure that you get a copy of the press release because it has all the pertinent data there. So we anticipate the film being released the latter part of October or the first part of November. And once it's released, we have uh, everything developed now with the exception of the website and people will be able to hit the website and order uh, the film via PayPal. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that will give you all an idea uh, as to the struggle and how deep it is and how committed people are to making it better. Uh, Harold, um, I think we got about, uh, it's still well, I think I'm getting a little feedback from your phone. Okay. Uh, is to maybe just turn the volume down when you're not talking. That, that'll help okay. you. Okay, thank you. So that'll give you all an idea where we are yeah. in 2020 with black farmers. Um, it's not to say that other people don't care. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, the Elizabeth Warren campaign, uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign, showed a great deal of interest. Uh, in this issue. Uh, Cory Booker, Senator from New Jersey, they are doing things that are remarkable, that are going to move the needle on this issue. And they're willing to speak out and do things and set up programs uh, and policies in place that specifically deal with the black farmers. The black farmers are the major point of contact of this racism and this uh, deprivation, as well as this stealing of the land and wealth. 
So I would like to, I, I want to be sure to let people know that other people care about this issue and there, and there are people in high places in Washington that care and there will be things coming out very soon in this regard that will be proof that the, the, the reason why we are focusing on this issue, there are other people in Washington in high places that care about it as well. Yeah. Well, man, let me say, uh, Julia, uh, Michael, and Wayman, and, and Brother Lawrence, man, this is, uh, this blows my mind that here in 2020, we are still dealing with this plantation mentality, man. And, uh, where do we go from here? I know Lawrence said you guys had something set up to go on CNN to discuss uh, this uh, situation with black farmers, but you got bumped because of the Supreme Court nominee uh, happened to be coming forward that same day. Where are you with CNN? And, and uh, are, are you going to be able to uh, do that program? Because that's well, where you need to be. Well, uh, we're waiting for CNN to get back in contact with us. The issue is that uh, the coalition and many of its uh, member groups took issue with the Biden uh, policy dealing with black farmers. Um, we wanted a, a plan uh, and a policy. And we know if the policy is not written now and put in writing, uh, what are we to look forward to when they take office? So I'm making it very clear, uh, we made it very clear to them that it's unacceptable for them not to develop a policy for black farmers the way they develop policy for other groups. And uh, for them to tell us that uh, it's unconstitutional to do for, for, for black farmers what they're doing for other groups is really an insult. Um, Michael, you want to uh, respond, respond to that just quickly? We don't have much time left. Well, it's, it's all about the get along, and it's all about um, the Secretary of Agriculture, Bill Sapp, and Joe Leonard, how under um, the Barack Obama administration, they had changed the findings to non findings and to foreclose on farmers' land. You know, we got in the mix of Barack Obama was the best thing that happened to black folks. And that's not true. If black folks really know the true value of what happened under the agriculture part, they would, they would look at him in a different manner. Because anytime black farmers have lost over 15 million acres of land and steady losing land because of discrimination under this agency, and you put somebody like Bill Sapp in office and knowing that he had over 600 complaints against him in Iowa, why would you put somebody in that? in that position. Then you put Joe Leonard as well. And they steadily discriminated against black farmers. And when the investigative report came out that they was they was changing finance to non finance to keep from paying these farmers so they can lose their land. You know, if we was a spotted owl or anything else, this situation wouldn't have been going on as long as it had. From administration after administration, from president after president, black farmers are steady losing and steady losing wealth and instead of being um, killed, hung out, hung out in trees and all this kind of stuff, this stuff is still going on. When you got <laughs> white farmers that want your land, they will do anything and everything to try to get your land. I got chicken houses, never got in operation. They vandalized my houses before I can get chickens in them. All this was part of the USDA plan to run me out of business. So these things steady going on. Okay, thank you. Hey, man, I want to I wanna thank uh, first uh, you guys for coming on. You're welcome to come back because this is something that we need to follow up on. I would like to thank Jackie uh, for taking time out of her busy schedule and, and Chris. But we need, to, we need to stay on top of this, man, because I want to say some things. I just don't have the time to say them now, but I will be writing about them on Black Men in America, and we will have this up on Black Men in America. And so we can send this around the country uh, tomorrow because that's what we got to do. We got to put you guys out there. So Wayman and, and Michael and, and Julia, uh, Ms. Henshaw, stay in the fight, stay in the struggle, man, because we need you. And, and like you said, there, there, there are not on, enough honest people out there. We are honoring thieves and liars today. We are honoring thieves and liars. Anybody, yep. anybody yep. tells yep. a lie.
So you guys stay, stay with the struggle, and we're going to get out of here. But remember, you always got a place here on uh, Speak the Truth on Zoom Sunday. Okay, Thank Chris, you. you can take us out. Thank you. All right. Thanks for everybody for showing up. Thanks for everybody for your time. Be safe. Thank Be you. Safe. Thank you. Everybody Thank you, Julia. Thank, Thank you so everything. much. Mm -hmm.